Good morning. I'm so glad you are here. Uh, whether you normally join us or you're just jumping in for the first time today to see what it's all about, I'm so thankful that you are part of this service, that you have come. Uh, just so you know, coming up in just a couple weeks, August 29th, we're planning on doing a car wash here at the church. And it's not a fundraiser car wash, it's a free car wash. And we're going to do it for uh, the workers at DHS as well as for our foster families here in Lincoln County. And, and we're going to open it up to all of them uh, to be able to come, just drive their cars up, wash them. We'll be able to stay. They'll sit in their car. We'll stay outside uh, so we can social distance. We'll have people in groups of washing and drying to be able to social distance. Uh, but it'll be a neat time to just kind of serve. And so if you would like to be a part of that, uh, it can be as little or as much as you want, uh, but please, you can sign up when you do your uh, connection card online at the end of the service during uh, our announcement time. You can sign up in that connection card or you can call or email the church office and uh, let us know, hey, I want to be a part of that. And even if you can't do much, you feel like, well, I can't uh, really wash a car, that's okay. You can come. We can set a chair out of the way. You can even just be a part of, of encouraging and celebrating together, just a way to show love uh, to some people in our community. And so please uh, join us for that, and uh, let's open with a word of prayer today as we begin our time of just lear learning and worship. Father, I thank you. I thank you for, for the ability to worship you. I thank you that you are God and that you, even as God, even as the all-powerful, almighty creator, you still want a relationship with us. Lord, that we don't have to worry about upsetting you or angering you that, you, that you love us and you care about us. And Father, I pray that out of gratitude, out of love for you in return, uh, that we would today be able to just simply learn and worship and honor you. In your name I pray, amen. Hi, it's Ben. I'm part of the missions team here at Newport Christian. And every month we like to bring up an organization or a missionary that we support up in prayer together as a church family. This month, uh, we want to lift up the healths again, because that's part of our um, prayer this month. But also we want to lift up Oregon Christian Convention Camp and Retreat Center. Uh, just like every other camp and retreat center this summer, I'm sure uh, it's been a very big different uh, thing for them. And uh, loss of, re of revenue from campers and uh, conventions and such. So um, it does look like they'll have some stuff this fall. So hopefully they can continue to reach out and be uh, a blessing to those campers and to have those uh, conventions and retreats for uh, Christians here in Oregon. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time that we can have to come together and lift up our missionaries up to you. We just thank you for all of our missionaries and all of those mission organizations that we support. And we thank you for bringing them through these t last tough few months. We we'll specifically we want to lift up Oregon Christian Convention uh, Camp and Retreat Center to you. Uh, going through COVID-19 this summer has uh, been a hit financially. And uh, we just want to lift them up and uh, please bring in some revenue. And thank you that they are continuing to offer things I know the, the big uh, convention that they normally have live and in person uh, this summer went on uh, through online, and we thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to do that. And uh, just uh, <clears throat> thank you for everything that the OCC provides um, for the Christian church community here in Oregon and in the Northwest. Just continue to bless them and uh, continue to make that a successful place of sharing your love and other and sharing your love and and your good news. We also just want to thank you that you got the health back to Cambodia 
uh, safe and sound and all the correct paperwork and all the uh, negative COVID tests that they had to go through. And just thank you that they are now able to be there and be a part of uh, your work there in Cambodia. I just want to thank you, Lord, for the members and regular attenders here at Newport Christian and the support that they uh, give to the missions team so we can support those missionaries and mission organizations throughout the world. Just thank you for your son and for everything you do for us. Keep us all safe and healthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for everything that you do. You don't have a ton of things in common with God, but there is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship. What kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're going to speak this week is probably not going to be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're going to speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send. It's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds and speak life to their kids. For spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk and not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. Last week, we started a sermon series on not normal, on trying to really take a look at, at where we're at and uh, what, what is going on in 2020 in this crazy year and really trying to kind of learn, even while we're in it, in the midst of all of this turmoil, trying to learn what good we have seen come out of it or, or what bad that we want to reverse and, and maybe even look back at, at what was normal and see what what have we learned about that even looking back and and really as we move forward what what can we pull out of this what what can we do to make things not normal to not get back to just normal but to to be better than normal and so today what i want to do is i i really want to look at this this term christian and Christian is a weird term, and, and it's one of those terms that, that we use and we talk about becoming a Christian and how it's, e- it's easy to be a Christian, and it's simple, and yet, and yet we struggle sometimes to know what, what is a Christian. You look through the Bible and you go, I don't see Jesus or Peter or Paul calling people to become Christians. So what, what does that mean even? What, what does that mean? Look like what what, what? what? What do we mean by becoming a Christian? And and the term Christian is an, an interesting term. It's not really used much in the New Testament, actually. In fact, there's only used three times in the New Testament. And and the Christians actually didn't start referring to themselves. That wasn't a, a term that that really became normal for for hundreds of years. And so. 
We look at the, at the New Testament and these, these new followers and what they called, what they were doing, what they were following, their beliefs, they called the way. And so oftentimes they called themselves followers of the way or something like that. And, and in fact, the most common thing that they would call themselves was, was saints. That was the most common term that they used for themselves. They liked the term saints, but, but it wasn't so much how we think of saints. When we think of saints, I think we, we probably start to lean on uh, Catholic, in, Catholic interpretation that may have influenced us at one way or another, this, this idea of of someone holy, someone who's, who's super spiritual, someone who's, who's done something amazing or maybe even miraculous in their life. But, but they didn't use it like that. They used saints for someone who was, was set apart, someone who was consecrated to God. And that's how they referred to themselves. And in fact, the term saints, every time in the New Testament it's used, it's used in plural. They don't use it individually for themselves, but they use it for themselves as a, as a group. And they didn't, they didn't uh, while they saw themselves as, as individually choosing to follow Christ, they, they thought of themselves as this set-apart group for him. And so they didn't really use the term Christian, but so then where did this term Christian come from? It was only used three times in the New Testament. In fact, if you look in the book of Acts chapter 11 with me, you can see, because the Bible tells us where that term was first used. And this was a time when, when Paul was preaching in Antioch. And Barnabas came and joined him, and they were all preaching and, and sharing the gospel message, and it was awesome. And here's what we see, Acts chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 26. <clears throat> Actually, let's jump back and start in verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And that's it. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's, that's where we see this term first used. It was only used two other times in the Bible. Very simple, no, no explanation, no going into detail. In fact, it leaves it even open to why they were called Christians or, or who called them Christians. And so there's, there's been speculation on, on even the thought behind that. Uh, the term Christian really means little Christ, like someone who's trying to copy and imitate Christ. So it could be, it's possible, a lot of people believe that, that this was actually a derogatory, insulting term. And that, and that the people who, who were there in the town who didn't like the Christians were calling them little Christs as an insult. Oh, you little Christs. Oh, trying to copy Jesus again. And so a lot of people believe that, that it was a derogatory term. Some people just think that it was a defining term. Just a, a way, is, again, it's a new group. They don't really have a, a term to describe them. And so maybe the people there in Antioch just thought, you know what? Let's just call them Christians. They're trying to follow this guy, so let's just call them the people who are like that guy. And so that's a possibility. Uh, the third option, which is kind of the one I tend to go towards myself, but uh, I'm not even sure if it makes that big of a deal. Uh, the third option is that that term called in that passage, where they were called Christians first in Antioch, that term called everywhere in the Bible except once, it is used when Christ uh, or God called someone or he, he gave them a calling or he, um, he you know, gave some sort of a, a, a calling towards people. And so it could be that, that actually God himself gave this inspiration to whether Barnabas, it seems, seems like a good choice, Barnabas is such an encourager, or someone else there in the group, that they should be called Christians. And so that's a, a big definite possibility as well. And there's not 
Christian is not a bad term. Uh, it's a term that that I kind of like in some ways because it's it's so welcoming, right? A Christian, you can you can kind of leave it a little bit broad, and it, it can be very inclusive when you uh, instead of trying to define yourself as something very uh, narrow and personal, it, it's a little bit more welcoming of a phrase of a, or of a term. But the problem also goes along with that same idea because because it is so open. We're given this this title and yet and yet nowhere in the Bible do you see a definition for it. And the problem with that is when you take a title and you give a group of people a title and you don't give them a definition, what happens is that allows everyone the freedom to create their own definition. And when we look at all of the different types of churches and denominations and groups of people who just throw out the term Christian and the different levels uh, of, of obedience that we find in there, it's so open-ended as to what is a Christian? Well, what, what does that look like? How, how does a Christian supposed to live? What, what does that mean? And so it's so open that it, it can cause some problems. And it allows us to really kind of define our own selves in that term rather than than trusting the Bible to define it for us. We get to hunt and peck and pick and choose what we want to be, what we think our theology is. And we get to believe what we want to believe about who we are or who we should be. And it's kind of a dangerous thing. It's a very slippery slope. And so if, if Christian is, is so difficult, what then should we be? Well, I think that's a good question. That's kind of what I want to look at. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus uh, starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, the most incredible sermon ever preached, is, is put in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in this sermon, Jesus is, is preaching and he's sharing the gospel message and he's, he's sharing all of these truths from God. He's challenging people, calling them to live for God to make this amazing difference. And he says things that would have been mind-blowing to his listeners, things that, that so often I think we kind of blow past because we've, we've heard them so often before, but things that really would have caused the people there to pause and listen. He preaches about if someone takes your, your garment, give them your cloak or cloak, give them your garment as well. He, he talks about um, loving your enemies he talks about serving. He talks about doing things not for show, but, but for relationship with God. And about giving in secret and about praying in secret. He talks about all of these different uh, amazing concepts in there. Things that are challenging people, not just to, to be living for God, not just to do physical actions for God and to obey a law, but actually to have hearts for God. No, 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 not just don't steal, don't even covet. No, 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 don't kill, don't even hate. No, 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 don't uh, commit adultery. No, not don't even lust. And he, and he gives all of these challenges to ask his people, these listeners, take the next step, do more. And it's an amazing challenge. And he's calling them to obedience, amazing, incredible obedience. Well, they're up on this, this mountain, and they've done the, the Sermon on the Mount, and at the end of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8, they come down off the mountain. And here they've been listening to this amazing, powerful sermon, and everybody is on a spiritual high, right? It's amazing. It's incredible. And right off the bat, they have a re reality check. Because as soon as they finish all of these sermons, they come off the mountain, and they run into a leper, a man with leprosy who comes up to Jesus and asks him, Jesus, heal me. Please make me whole again. And so right after that, then they even go to the next situation. And, and Jesus deals with a leper and he goes to the next situation. And here comes, here comes a soldier, a centurion. A, a, a leader in the Roman army, and this centurion comes and asks Jesus, would you heal my servant? 
And it's so ironic because here is Jesus and he's been calling and asking and challenging his people, step up, do the right thing, even when it's hard, you know, live for God. And they come down, they're on the spiritual high and they're immediately confronted with that situation. In fact, have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever been on vacation and and you come back and you, you're you all nice and tan, you're well rested, everything's good. You may even have a day or two at home to kind of unpack and get things calmed down. And then you go in Monday, you sit down at your desk, boom, and reality hits. You pop open your email and there's 7,000 emails that are pressing and weighing on you. Your coworker comes in your office to ask for help in a difficult situation. Some other issue pops up right away that needs to be handled immediately. And all of a sudden you're right back to reality. And that's where Jesus is. He's been preaching about all of these things. Everybody's doing great. They come back down and they're faced with reality. And these two situations are directly are directly uh, in alignment with what he has just been preaching about. Because, because a leper, these lepers, the, the picture this, think about this. A leper was this, this person who was seen as, as unclean. Right? In fact, if they were around other people, they would call out, unclean, unclean, so that people would know to keep their distance. People would know to stay away. They lived outside the city in, in leper communities because they had this disease that no one wanted to catch or be around. They had to separate themselves from their family, from society. These people that were, were looked down on. In fact, a lot of times when someone had a disease like this, it was assumed that they had the disease because they had committed some horrible sin or their parents had committed some horrible sin or, or something like that had happened, that they had done something bad and this was their punishment. And then we see this, this soldier, this centurion. And the centurion, if you, if you understand, the Romans and the Jews didn't get along. <laughs> The, the, the Romans were people who had come in, who had taken over the Jewish land. In fact, when they had come in, they had desecrated the temple. They had gone through the, the, the Holy of Holies and the whole temple and, and had treated it poorly. They had disrespected the Jews' beliefs. They had taken away the Jews' land. They had removed the Jews' freedom. In fact, the Romans thought of themselves as a superior race. They looked down on the Jews as lesser people. And here's Jesus now in these two situations being asked for help by two people that he's just been talking about how you need to help them. And here's how he responds the book of Matthew chapter 8, verse 3 is how he responds to the man with leprosy. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. So here is a man who is seen as a sinner, who is seen as unclean. And the first thing Jesus does is touch him. Jesus could have healed him without touching him. He was a, a rabbi. To touch an unclean person was, was something that rabbis weren't supposed, supposed to do. And yet, the first thing Jesus does is go the extra mile, is show compassion, and then he helps him. Moving over to verse 7, and this is with the centurion asking about his servant. Chapter 8, verse 7, and Jesus says, Shall I come and heal him? And this is, a, this is an incredible statement because, again, this was a centurion. This was a Roman. This was a man who had completely mistreated the Jews, that the Jews completely hated, and the Romans hated the Jews. And Jesus' first response is to offer, Should I come to your house? For, for a rabbi to offer to go into a Roman's house under his roof was huge. And the crowd would have been stunned. What, what are you doing here, Jesus? 
Why are you acting this way? And Jesus is, is right away, as soon as they come off the mountain, representing the very things that he had been teaching and preaching. And he's living them out. And it's interesting because as he's been teaching and preaching all of these concepts on the mountain, he's, he's guiding people, he's teaching them, he's showing them the way to act. Now he's living it out. But right before he left the mountain, there's an interesting little section. And it's a story that, that if you grew up in Sunday school, if you've been around kids' church at all, you're probably familiar with. It's the story of the wise man and the foolish man. It's in Matthew chapter 7. And it starts in verse 24. And it says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds beat, blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And so he tells this story of these two men who built a house, one on a solid foundation, one on a weak foundation. And how do you build on that foundation? How do you choose your foundation? It's the type of obedience you have. If, if you build your house on the rock, that means that, that you are hearing the words of Christ and putting them into action. And if you want to build your house on the sand, it's like listening to Christ and not putting his words into action. Again, let me read the verse half of verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. If you, if you hear Christ's words and, and don't put them into practice in your life, you are foolish. And you see, we are not called to be Christians. We're called to be Christ followers. We're not, we're not called to be people who, who live under this title, but we're called to be people of action. We're called to be people who, who don't just believe the right things about Christ. It's not about what your theology is. We're called to be people who are obedient to Christ, who do what he says. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. In fact, when you look at history in the world and you look back at the men and the women who changed history, who made a difference in this world, it's not the people who believed the right things. There were plenty of people who believed the right things in a certain situation. But it's those who actually acted. It's those who did something that made a difference. And those are the ones that we look up to. We're not called to be Christians. You see, we're called to be people who are followers of Christ. We're not called to live under a title. We're called to something so much better. And we've, we've maybe lived as just Christians and been content to be under that title, and that's been our normal for years. But I don't want to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to where we were. I want to go to better than normal. I don't want to just go back to living like a Christian and, and being able to fit my own definition under that word. I, I want to go towards being a Christ follower. I want to be someone who's better than a Christian. I want to be someone who's not just uh, living under a title, but who's living in obedience. Will you join me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. 
I thank you for, for his teaching on this earth, for the times that, that he taught and directed and guided. Lord, I thank you for his example. I thank you for his, his living out his words and showing us exactly what he meant. Lord, help us to not be people who sit back, who feel content to make sure that the life that we're living just happens to fit under a title nice and neat in a great little package. But Lord, help us to be people who get up and move. Help us to be people who are better. Help us to be people who are better tomorrow than we were yesterday and who keep progressing. And Lord, help us to be people who are obedient to you, who are obedient to what Christ had called us to be. Help us to be people who listen to his words and put them into action. In your name I pray, amen. You are the word at the beginning, one without the Lord most high. Your head and glory in creation, now revealed and you are Christ, what a new name it is. 
this morning is communion meditation. Um, the scripture I wanted to use is Isaiah 53, um, 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I was thinking about this as we were, have been clearing some of our, we bought a house uh, two months ago, and as we're clearing our land, and um, about a one acre of our four and a half acres is actually clear, all the rest has trees and and um, blackberries and elderberries and salmon berries all in it. So as we're clearing, sometimes a little six foot by 10 foot patch in a, in a night, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, this is a lot of work and it's, and it's um, but in the end it's worth it. And, as, and I, I've often heard that, you know, God wants all of our heart. And there's areas I know in my heart that I have, you know, let get overgrown and brush covered with brush and and uh, salmon berries and blackberries and all and everything. And um, and I was thinking about that this week as um, I've pretty much given up watching one of my favorite genres of movies is um, is action adventure. But of course, most action adventure movies have you know, swearing and a lot of blood and stuff. And I've pretty much given up, given up all watching all them movies. But about a week ago, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to watch one. And after I watched it, I was sitting there thinking about, you know what? And, and thinking about that in this meditation is like, you know what I did? I threw blackberries and salmon berries on an area that God had tilled and cleaned up. And now, you know, and it's funny how we do that. We, you know, I, or I do anyways. God clears an area in my heart. And sometimes, you know, I do it. Sometimes the devil does it. But, you know, we're supposed to give God all of our heart. And, but we, we kind of keep areas of that back. And, and I just wanted to let you know that, you know, it's a struggle for all of us. But to be more Christ-like, we have to kind of let God get in there and prune areas that need to be pruned. And I was thinking kind of about that for this meditation that, you know, that's what communion with God is, is letting him prune, letting him um, take, care of, take care of our yard and, and, and give it to him. So let, let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together and just thank you for your word and just thank you for coming into our lives and to um, teach us what is right and help us and, and prune us where we need to be pruned and help us to become more like you every day and draw closer to you and, and uh, be more like you every day. In Christ's name, amen.
Hi, it's Ben. I just got a couple announcements for you this week. First off, I want to uh, talk about our Foster Community Car Wash, which is on August 29th at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're gonna host a car wash for our foster families and DHS workers to show them some love in this crazy time. We will be having socially distant washing and drying stations so we can all work safely apart from one another. We're also planning to give out prepackaged snacks to people as they wait for their car to be washed. If you'd like to be a part of this event, sign up by checking the box on your online connection card when you fill out Sunday's attendance or by emailing the church office. So, talking about crazy times, school is st gonna start up one way or another here come this fall. In September, the kids will be going online and the teachers will be trying to teach them online and the staff are gonna be trying to be flexible and uh, come up with new ways and new ideas to teach our kids in our community. Um, and it's, and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be difficult for everybody involved. Kids, teachers, parents, uh, it's new and different. And uh, so let's remember to keep them in prayer as they start up for this fall and this new way of going to school. Last thing I got is just remember to go to newportchristian.com slash connect and fill out that attendance card. Thank you guys for everything you do. Have a great week. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate you being a part of the service. Uh, if you need something this week, this, as, as we spend more time alone uh, during quarantine and, and more time in isolation, this is a time where, where Satan is going to attack. Uh, he's going to attack us at our weakest areas. And if you are struggling right now uh, with, with temptations, with um, depression, with anything like that, please reach out. I would love to talk with you a little bit about that. I'd love to pray with you a little bit about that. I'd love to even maybe help you find uh, someone who might be able to, to help you through this time. Uh, and so please reach out. You can call the church, 541 265-2531 or email office at newportchristian.com. Uh, but please continue. Don't, don't bottle up any struggles you may be going through. Uh, reach out. Uh, continue to uh, fight through this. And we'd love to help you through that. Thanks. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, the way that you love us and the way that you care us, Lord. I thank you for how you uh, pursue us and how you are with us even when it doesn't feel like it. God, help us to have your peace and your comfort right now. And Lord, help us to, um, to continue to be strong in you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.